Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm Abed Karazi with Abercrombie & Fitch. I'm a senior vice president of global stores design and construction. Nothing gets done without going through, through my department. Uh, I want to walk you through uh, our, our brand. Uh, we cater for those privileged Ivy League uh, good-looking kids who are looking for inspiration. They're uh, looking for uh, a sexy, classic look and they are the coolest people we think of. Our, uh, when we start looking for hiring people, you have to have two, two uh, qualities, being, being nice and sexy. <laughs> the smartness comes later. <laughs> that's what we teach them to do. <laughs> so that, that's our company. Our subject is, um, you know, how, how do we enter globally into the markets? Th uh, please remember that this discussion does not include Canada. Uh, we've been in Canada for a long time, and I think uh, our brothers and sisters there, they act the same way we act in the U.S., so that was an easy entry for North America. Uh, our brands, we have Abercrombie & Fitch, we have Abercrombie Kids. Gilly Hicks, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with it, it's a new brand that we incepted about three years ago. It's targeted some, uh, towards sexy ladies, it's all lingerie. And uh, we have uh, Hollister, which is a very successful brand that we started about nine, nine, ten years ago, which is full of technology and it's based on all uh, uh, surf life beach out of Huntington Beach, California. So if you've seen our Hollister stores, you can see all these uh, cool surfers playing in the water. And that is usually a life feed from Huntington Beach. And now we're working on a life feed for Gilly Hicks which is a brand uh, uh, story made out of Sydney. So we, we're going to start broadcasting from Sydney Bandai Beach in the very near future. Uh, where are we today? If you'd notice the title, it says current and future flagships. The future ones are an invisible ink. We don't like to share those. <laughs> so, so we've been uh, expanding mainly through Europe. Uh, you know, the countries are there uh, through Asia. These are existing stores for Abercrombie and & Fitch and some kids. And then on top of that, we've got about uh, uh, the Hollister stores. We've got about 82 other stores that are already existing in, in the same countries or additional countries. And if I had to add the seagulls on top of the moose, I don't know who would win. I think in quantity, the seagull will, but the moose will, will win. And, uh, and powerful and sales. Uh, let's talk about our brand. The main thing we, we focus on is keeping our brand image no matter where we go. Now, this is a store uh, we've done in, did we skip one? Here we go, here's in New York. That's our first flagship we did in New York. And we try to, to, to accommodate our design to the, to the buildings we like and to the locations we we, we, we find and uh, we deal with that. This is on Fifth Avenue and 56. Uh, this stores, this is a, in Tokyo, 11 story store, literally 11 story store. The footprint is so small in Tokyo, so we went vertically with it. And uh, we were very, we, we built it from the ground up. And uh, we were very lucky to, to be able to accommodate the same designs. Uh, Dusseldorf, uh, Everywhere we go, one thing that's non-negotiable is our brand image, which creates a lot of problems for us in those countries. Because for those who, of you who worked in Europe, they're big on, on uh, they want to see through the, the storefront windows, merchandise, and they want light and stuff. And we're like, I don't think so. <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> uh, this is a store uh, in Singapore, daytime, nighttime. Again, the same image, the same, the same brand representation. Uh, I'm focusing most of our discussion on our count, uh, on ANF, only because uh, when we started to grow globally, the ANF brand was the known brand. So we'll 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 talk about that later. Hollister in the U.S. is very popular in Europe, in Asia. People didn't know what Hollister is. But, but if you're smart enough in your uh, marketing, Hollister now is making more money than a and uh, overseas. A uh, few images from the inside of the stores. It's all premium quality. We have a lot, a lot of details and designs. 
stairs, we, we, we keep them the same design everywhere we go. We run into problems with codes and, sli and the glass slippage and all that, you know, bullshit that comes with it. And you have to know your venues and you have to find out the certifications and who's going to sign it off and blah, blah, blah. But as long as we get to the final look of what we want, we, we make it happen. Uh, there's a lot of interior pictures. This is the big thing, excitement. How you're going to create excitement about our brand when you go into a new country. Uh, we spend a lot of money planning for that excitement ahead of time. Anywhere from our barricade marketing when we, when we start our uh, new projects, uh, we're very big on barricade marketing. The biggest barricades we can build, we will build them and we will uh, brand them with our current images and that creates problems for us because we like half-naked guys. <laughs> and there are countries that they don't like half-naked guys. <laughs> so, so that takes you to travel, meet with them, explain and such. These are pictures like from Paris, uh, Milan, uh, Brussels, uh, and these are happy young ladies that took pictures with some of our models. We go crazy on creating that buzz and excitement once we enter. And literally, uh, people know about it coming and they, we don't advertise the opening date of the store till about only three weeks before we open. And that's part of the strategy. So our marketing group, our CEO, he's a genius about that. And he approves every plan for our excitement. And sometimes you see buildings are really architecturally, like Brussels, we inherited this old, old building. We couldn't do much with it, but look at the lines. Uh, in London recently, we kicked off the G Gilly Hicks brand. We went in and we wanted to bang the city with four stores at the same time. And we didn't have enough time to, to really build them, but we made it happen only because we've been in London for a while. If it was a new country, I would have never agreed on doing that. So when we created the bus for the Gilly Hicks in London, we rented five double-decker buses. <laughs> we, we, we sat all the half-naked models on the top of the buses, <laughs> and we drove them through the town, and then they were throwing out on these umbrellas at every location they arrive, and then we split them to the other malls. You know, you bus number one, White City, bus number two, Westfield, blah, blah, blah. And it was a very successful opening. And our main competitor in Gilly Hicks is, of course, Victoria's Secret, who are not there yet. Uh, let's talk about what do we do. So when we start planning a new country, you know, there's a lot of work that we do way in advance. I'm talking about anywhere from a year to 18 months. Because all these departments you see here have to be involved in, in the planning of how they're going to enter that new country. Uh, real estate is real estate. They just want to get a, a lease signed and it's on the books that they did their job. What kind of a building and such, that's my job then to fight about it and we'll come to that process. Uh, store planning, of course, we, that's part of my department. Procurement is a, big, is a big function. They need to understand which region and which areas, and they need to understand by working with, the, with our transportation, our tax, how they're gonna import if we want to import into the country and such. Brand senses and marketing, we spoke about. They have to be aware of it. Uh, in advance, a location of mer merchandise, which warehouse we have coming from. Our main, our main uh, uh, hub is Columbus, Ohio. And then we found out that we need to have some uh, rental hubs in, in Europe and in Asia, just in, in one in each region to help, to help on taxes and uh, importing into, the, into countries. Uh, finance, of course. They're the one who hold the dollars, and they, have, they ask most of the questions, as we all know. Uh, HR recruiting, very challenging. You know, how, how are we going to find those, those good-looking, smart people <laughs> that we're going to hire in these countries? 
how we're going to culturally fit them and train them. So typically, the HR uh, grew are, are uh, in, into the country about six to eight months before we, the actual opening of the store, okay? Just trying to recruit. And, uh, and that, that adds another requirement, which is now finding office space for them to work from, which, is, which we all don't think about because we're, we're worried about building a store. So the office space is part of my group's responsibility to make sure it's, uh, we find one and we make it ready for their functions. Uh, legal, uh, IT, again, IT usually rolls in into each country about eight months because they don't know how long it's going to take the service to get there and where they're getting it from. You know, I, I, I have open stores where literally our, our schedule, we turn over a flagship three weeks before opening, and uh, that some stores, I got the service at three weeks, which is way too late because now we need to use systems for our employees and such. So it is a struggle uh, for them. Uh, legal, again, they're involved in everything from hiring to making contract, expats, packages, sometimes we do, all that kind of stuff, so they need to know about where we're going. Loss prevention, their job is to really communicate with the local authorities from the police department, fire departments, and such, because to control the crowds outside the store is not easy. It's not just we have a crowd. We have to submit a plan of queuing to every authority. It has to be signed by, by the police department and by planning department, depending where you are, how you're going to manage that, that queuing. In Tokyo, we had queuing that went six blocks. So, so we had a police guy at every intersection of every block with a stop, go, stop, go sign to, to get people in. Uh, maintenance, again, we, maintenance usually I get them involved early on and uh, I try to, to have them visit the sites a lot during construction and I try to introduce them to the old subcontractors that are working. And I'll tell you, 50% of the time, they will use either my GC to set up a maintenance program with contractors locally that they know, or they will do direct deals with my subcontractors. Uh, store operations, store control, they have the biggest job because they're the one putting everything together from hiring, recruiting, to to loss, coordinating with loss prevention and such. Tax, transportation department, how we're gonna get into that country and how we're gonna ship uh, things, distribution. And the biggest one, don't think, you don't think about it in the US, is health and safety, which we'll talk about. That is the, the biggest issue we run into Europe, okay? There's, you don't know who's who. And they can come and tell you you're okay uh, when, when you're open, but two months later they show up, well, we don't like this, you know. And, and it's weird that the laws in Europe are very strict on health and safety uh, that we're not used to. So we're trying to learn them one after one. And are, they, are all these groups informed of the timeline and strategy expansion? What we do, you can't meet, you have to meet with, you have to assign a leader for each group. And what we do, we have a monthly leadership meeting, only the big bosses, the VPs, because it ha they're the one who has to make the plan for their group. So our job is we sit in a room and we, th we create a time and action plan, again, way in advance, and we say, okay, where are you, where are you, where are you? We have a local dashboard that everybody reads and, and uh, completes their tasks. But it's very cumbersome, so we decided, you know what, if I have to spend two hours reading 600 items of every group, I ain't gonna be doing my job. So, so we told every guy, you know, here's your time in action, you give us an update every month where you're at. So that is one part I would say, if you're successful at managing it, you, your life will, will be very easy. And, and really, I can't take, nobody can take credit for putting the group together. It is a leadership group. Of course, in your company, if you're a VP, you're a leader. 
So our job is to, to set up this up and the CEO has nothing to do with it. You know, the CFOs sometimes attend it uh, to, see, to see how the program is going. And then the last question is, do they have the time to complete their task? Uh, half the time they say, hey, you're putting me in a bind. You know, can you change the store opening? I'm like, no, we can't because our plan is to open so many in Q1, 2, 3, and 4. And our plan when we start a new project is typically, you know, a year or, or a year and a half in advance. So, so when I commit to a day of opening, that never changed. And it will never change. Uh, on the maintenance section, I think uh, there is a, that is a very important item you have to think about. And there are a lot of vendors, I think, uh, one of them I met here is Resicom. They do our maintenance globally. So if you're lucky to find a person or one company that has all these suppliers and uh, you know, they have that network in Europe, even if they're based in the US, it's okay. They'll get it done for you. Uh, so that's, that's the initial step we go through to make the plan. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my department now, our design. What's, what's the task that I have to deal with when we start thinking about a new project. The, the, the timeline for a new country entry is very, very critical and I was very, very adamant about telling it to the whole company. You tell me about the country that you want to enter, I need about, to know about it at least 18 plus three months, 24 months in advance, right? No, 21, that was a test. <laughs> because I, I need to, to set up, you know, when I went like to, to Paris, I had no clue who's, who's good architects in Paris to do my production document, who's a good GC in Paris, you know, I need to go do my research. So, so that timeline in our company is part of our strategy and I will never budge on it, period. No matter what names they call me and they do, I will not budge on it if I have to be successful in building a flagship because our flagships vary from 25,000 square feet to 50. And they're vertical, they're horizontal, they're you know, multiple floors, basement, you name it, I've never seen it. Uh, you know, and, and our CEO loves, loves historic buildings. What does that do? <laughs> I've had to deal now with heritage people, what I can touch, not touch, you know. And that's, you have to deal with that and, and you make it happen. Establish the tasks for, for up of there. Who's gonna do your local consultants research? You know, who are you going to hire? That task, typically I leave it to myself and to my uh, VP of design, okay? And then the directors of construction usually are busy enough, they, they would not participate, so uh, us two, we make a trip to the country, we try to make some phone calls of people we know who we think they worked in that country just to get some leads and, uh, and we go interview people. Like literally, you know, in Singapore I walked on the street and I'm seeing big barricades, big projects, you know, Prada's here, Gucci's here, Chanel here, blah, 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 taking names of people and big companies and writing them down, contacting, contacting them, interviewing them until I found the person that really, you're following your gut feel. Everybody tells you, yeah, oh yeah, I can do it. Like, great, so show me how you're organized. Show me what you've done. So we got lucky, we, got, we found a company called Kingsman. They do it from A to Z, they're the biggest in uh, Singapore. And tell you what, they did a great job. So, so that task is repeated over and over again. In Europe, what's nice about it is the, the same consultants you find are able to, to work in certain countries, not just one. Like my Italian firms that I, that I work with for design and construction and the GCs, they do jobs for me in uh, Brussels, they do jobs in Paris, they do jobs in Amsterdam, but, and, they, and then they go out and hire local people that they worked with before to just 
be our face with the planning commissions and with the fire departments and such. So, so you have to also evaluate that. So after we've been, we've been doing this since 05, I think. So we got the good, a good data of who are the GCs. So what I do for them is, is I send them a spreadsheet and say, okay, here's my strategy. Tell me which countries you can be successful at. And, and they've been very, very honest to, they know our attitude. They, they've been very honest in saying, well, if you go to here, I'm, I'm the one, I'm your man. You know, if you go to here, here. So, so we established about four or five good GCs. Some of them are from the US that, that really are working for us now in multiple countries, but they still hire locals. Uh, local code analysis for each city and country. That is <laughs> very tough. You have to do a very good job at it, and trust me, when you think you, you really dotted every I, crossed every T, you missed something. And the stuff you missed is gonna be at the tail end of the store just before you open. Okay, you got your permits, you thought you got your permits. Your building, everything is great. You know, the fire department loves it, health and safety guy loves it, then they come, then you get to the end, it's like, okay, where's my certificate of occupancy? Well, we still we need to bring this guy. Well, how come this guy haven't been here before? So you, so you have to be involved at a high level because that's what they like. <clears throat> if you set up a meeting in Europe with the city department and you send your project manager there, he ain't gonna do the job. They care about titles, who's coming. So, Half of my time is meeting with the big guys from the city departments. I sometimes met with mayors to explain to them my issues and my brand, go through our brand history and ask for their support. And it does work. So don't, you've gotta be involved as a leader all the time, okay? Uh, do your analysis twice, do not leave it to interpretations, you know. We run into this in the US. Everybody interprets the code a different way. You ask this guy, well, I think they meant this way. The other guy, well, I don't know about that. So who knows? Uh, educate your in-house designers. It's all new. Do not assume they know it. What I've done is we do, I have a big group of designers and I split them into chain stores versus flagships. And I run a department that's about 50 between designers, project managers, construction managers, directors, and so forth. So we teamed, uh, we assigned certain designers certain countries based on skills. And we teamed them up with those architects in those countries. So, so now we have a record, like now I have an expert after those projects of, I have a, an expert in Germany. I have an expert for the UK. I have an expert for Paris, which is the worst uh, code uh, compliant city you can ever run into. You know, they're very complicated. So we divided that exper expertise among them and we told them, you know, whatever you know about the US and you know, you, were, you know it well, scrap it up, start fresh and start learning those countries. And that worked for us. Like if I have a question or, or, or if I'm building a flagship that somebody built a hoster store in Germany, my first meeting is sitting with that guy in-house. You know, the two designers sit together, go through ex uh, you know, exit routes. You won't believe how much those varies. You know, egress plans, all this fire requirements, they vary a lot. I mean, who've ever heard of an egress route that's 1.7 meters? That's like half, half my store and our stores I mean, imagine that, you know, our stores are room by room. So, so you've got to know that getting into the design before you lay out the store. Uh, construction documents, process control, and how much details. Don't reinvent the wheel, it works anywhere. If you get, if you do the mistake of changing your process, you will be lost, okay? I'm pretty sure every company has a process for their design. Where you start, step one, two, three. We call it in my department, I've got, this is my standard, this is my process, and this is how I'm gonna audit it. That process, we never deviated from. 
We met with so many people. They said, well, we do it here this way. I'm like, listen, pal, I'm the one hiring you. I ain't gonna learn your process because I'm not gonna learn you know, the Italian guy, the French guy, blah, blah. This is my process. You have to, to learn mine and you, and you just follow it. That helped us a lot in-house because then people are like, okay, here it is. Here's my design schedule, blah, blah, blah. They follow it, you train them. The first project is okay if they do mistakes on it, but other than that, the process now, they're adopting it ac actually for other, for other people. I need to start charging them for that. <laughs> uh, life safety process and education is a big one. There's so many people involved about life safety and you cannot figure out who is that person. You know, there are people involved about, you know, the health of the employees working in the store. Uh, Vienna, for example, the biggest challenge there is daylight and the, and, the can and the foot candle light required in the store, you know, the luxes. Uh, you guys have been to our stores, right? They're like, they're focused lights, very dark, loud music, a lot of energy, dancers everywhere, you know, that's our, our brand. Well, Vienna, they want daylight. Every employee sitting in any location they're working on, they have to be able to see daylight. Try to figure that one out. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, how about skylights? I found a company, I think from other conventions, they make those solar skylights that, you know, they're based on the reflective lenses. You put the dome on the roof and then it's like a duct tube that brings skylights. Well, no, that's, that doesn't work, that's artificial. I'm like, well, okay, so now we're arguing about definition of light and daylight. It is. So, and then they walk in and they say, well, I need 300 locks everywhere. Well, let me tell you this. 300 locks is about 30 foot candle. My store in the general areas is five. So where do you measure it? I measure it at the table, it's 30. So I'm compliant. He goes, no, I want it everywhere. So you start negotiating. Okay, why are you worried about it? So we start adding exit, you know, more lights and they're out of egresses just to make them happy. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I have a project in Vienna right now, we're gonna kill it because of that. Because the guy is like an ass about it. I'm like, okay, you know, you don't want us here? Yeah, my next step really now is going to the mayor. Tell him, do you want the revenue in your, in your district or not? Because we can't accommodate what this guy is asking and let him do his job, yeah. So, so there's a lot of, that is, a, the life and safety takes a lot of time of our design and inspections. I mean, a lot. So we actually now develop a life and safety department and for our company, it's three ladies, their job is life and safety for every store, every country we're entering. They hire legal, they hire whoever they need to hire to, to go find out the facts. The other problem is these guys have a language barrier. You know, nobody speaks English. So they all come, the German is German, he doesn't want to speak English. Even though he understands this, but he doesn't want to speak it. The Vienna guy, so you've got to get a translator, you've got to research in your company who knows multiple languages, even if they have no clue about the business, just take them. <laughs> okay, trust me, take them, <laughs> okay? Because they will help you. Uh, city approvals, who and when? Again, the same, the same thing. I'm, we, we spend, I don't know, I've repeated this three times, four times, you've gotta spend a lot of time on understanding those two items, okay? And the last item I have on this slide is, if you think it's gonna happen, while you're sitting in your office, take that out of your mind. You have to travel. So you have to have the money to travel, okay? I'm leaving here, I think tonight, I land home at midnight tomorrow morning, I have a flight to Amsterdam. I have an issue in Amsterdam with the city. All, half of my travels is dealing with the cities, the other half is construction. So. Here we, we find it easy because you, know, you send it to an expediter, he processes for you, so your, other, your attention now is mainly construction. Over there it's the opposite. You have to set it up 
construction over there is easy. Don't worry about it, okay? We really don't worry about it because there are some really good people there. Uh, the time difference is a problem. That's why you can't sit at your desk, you know? So many times I have meetings with AJ at 4 a.m. my time. So, so I negotiate with them and I alternate. Well, last meeting I woke up early. This meeting you're staying late, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that creates an, it creates an issue for your, for your schedule. But when you're there, it's easier to handle. Language barriers, the same thing. I tell my guys, you know, we all speak quick. I tell my guys, slow down. I have one engineer on my group, he's like, he's on fire. Like, I, I'm like, okay, repeat what you said again. <laughs> uh, so, so these guys, we have to train our people to speak slower and then to repeat to make sure the people understood. So email everybody uses, you know, everybody is an email king, but you're typing it in English. The guy who is French or Italian or stuff might not understand it. So I tell him, send an email, give them time to read it, follow up with a phone call, make sure they understood what you sent them, and then close the issue. I've got the Italians, they confuse Tuesdays with Thursdays. So we decided we're not going to use these words. We're going to say the day after Monday and the day after Wednesday. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> Now, no confusion. I'm like, I thought you told me Thursday, uh, Tuesday. He goes, no, you said Thursday. I'm like, dude, <laughs> cancel it. Take it out of the dictionary. <laughs> so we refer to it now in a different. Uh, so so you've, got, you've got to really pay attention to the. Uh, to, it's minimal to us. We don't think about them. But it's really not fair to treat them as if they know the language. OK. Uh, procurement. Uh, and our company was structured different, like I'm not in charge of procurement. They kind of report to me in a direct line because I give them their plan and they have to go execute it. I tell them, here's what I want. Come back to me of what's your strategy. And it's, cr it's, uh, it's crazy how that works because certain countries you're going to find out it's best for you to buy locally. And some countries, you're going to find out it's best to you to keep your process and ship from here. All our OSM schedule in some countries literally is the same. We ship everything from here in containers, okay? Because that's cheaper for us. You know, but, but like, for example, in Italy, I found a millwork guy, premium millwork guy. Yeah, his price in euro was higher than the U.S. dollar. But he saved me on shipping and taxes and duty and stuff. So we said we'll start making mill work in Europe, you know, in Europe. And if you get hung on, on the currency uh, conversion, you'll go crazy. Okay, I went in the mindset that the dollar is a euro. Okay, don't tell me a euro is 1.2 dollars. I can't handle that. You know, because they're pricing everything in euro, so if the price is acceptable to be in euro, <coughs> I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, so, we, so they all will tell you we'll do it. You have to give them a chance to give you a sample or a mock-up to do it. And then you'll find out if they can or not. Uh, we do a lot of curved glass cases. You know, the Italian guy said, huh. <laughs> I'm Italian. Glass, my specialty. Well, guess what? The glass came like, you know, wavy. Uh, even the shape was right, but the quality was bad, blah, blah, blah. So we, we started, because I used to make them actually in Canada, all my care of the glass cases, but the price was expensive and the, and the guy couldn't work it better. So we went to China and we started making them now in China and we shipped them from China to all over the, the universe because it worked for us, it saved us money, and shipping out of China was no big deal, okay? Uh, consult with your local suppliers for new global resources. You'll be amazed how many of your local suppliers know somebody somewhere outside the U.S. <coughs> they do. They won't offer it unless you ask it, okay, because they want the business. So I'm assuming you all have good relationships with your suppliers. 
you know, they, uh, they trust you, they, they will jump for you. So that's a great resource we found that we can use. Uh, certifications required for related items. That's a big one. You know, we buy all our light fixtures. We only light, want them this manufacturer, this, this look, this kind of bulb and such. Well, now our manufacturers, after we shared with them our expansion strategy, are willing to go certify their, their systems in those countries. So that's a good thing. Like I've got now, I can buy from Light Lab, and he, you know he's got the, the CCC rating, the ALC rating, the China rating, all these kinds of ratings, so I don't have to go through it. When I built in Japan, I didn't have the time for him to go through that uh, testing for his product, so I had to to find a vendor in Japan who can duplicate my fixture in Japan and get his ratings for that fixture. Did it look the same? Not really. Did it function the same? Yes, but you know, we care about the look too. So you've gotta be careful about these countries. What are the certification process for every item? And mainly the big ones are the HVAC units and the, the electrical units. The fire rating, oh my gosh, that will drive you crazy. I mean, I built a store, let me think, where was this at? In Germany, where for that district, that mall, everything you put in had to be fire rated class A or B. Storefront, we use wood, couldn't use wood. So I made it all out of plaster, you know, to, to be fire rated and it looked like wood. So I sent a full painter from the US to full paint the plaster to make it look like wood. All that comes into play and into the cost of the project. But if you know about it in advance, your procurement team then, then will not waste time sourcing. And that's why my design team is, is the guy, are the people who have to do all that discovery. That's why I said, again, I created specialists, you know, for every country. So, and we didn't do that, like, we didn't do mistakes, we did. You know, but we learned from those mistakes, you know, who's who, what are the ratings for every country and such. Uh, fire ratings, we talked about develop logical OSM owner supplied manual list that can accommodate your needs. Again, you've got you've to sit down, and I don't know if, if you guys run the procurement part of your uh, design construction. Who does here? Or, yeah. So, so you, so your job is really bigger than mine. I give them requirements, I tell them, and recommendations who I want to use at, at uh, certain stores. Because we're building like five, six stores, and I don't want them to do the mistake and put all their eggs in one, in one basket. So when they come back to me, hey, I'm gonna use this, this, this here, I'll, I usually flip it upside down and split it for them. Uh, expand your supplies base to, to and from the general contractors. That's a great source. My first store in Milan, I didn't know anything about Milan. We wanted to build it so quick because we were gonna lose the deal and the location. Again, by luck, I got hooked up with a company called EXA. They do all design, engineering, in-house, and their general contractor. So I made their packages to provide everything except fixtures tables, you know, except the loose fixtures. So these guys, of course, doing that, they had to take me to their suppliers to approve samples, approve, you know, mock-ups and such. And I was very honest with them at the end of the project. I said, do you mind now if I use your, your subcontractors that I like? And they said, no problem. You know, the guy, if he's willing to work for you, why not? So I picked up the greatest like millwork work guy in, in Milan. Their name is Modar. I'll be happy to share with you guys when you go international who's good, who's bad, if you send me emails. Uh, because, you know, we're all Americans. We want to be the best out there. That's really my theory. I don't, I don't try to hide things from uh, other retailers. Just don't ask me about the strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we found this millwork person who uh, did a great job for us. 
and now we use them all over the place. Uh, visit for QA process, cheaper sometimes to do, to do it domestically, yes, you will find it cheaper sometimes to ship shit from here, you know, uh, carpets and such. Do not sit at your office doing this. You ain't gonna get it done. You have to go out there and you have to visit those factories. Uh, construction. The, the research, again, you have to do now on these guys. They have no clue. I'm gonna try to go quick through this because, again, the, the, the gist of it is stick to your standard process and audit during construction. What you're gonna find out is these guys have no clue about project management, no matter where you go, no matter how good they are. They don't do construction schedules the way, of, the way we're used on doing them, where we want to know everything, you know, what's doing where. They just cram it with people on top of each other, <laughs> and then the quality you're getting, <laughs> until you show up there to see it and tell them to demo it and redo it, you, know, you don't know what you're getting. Uh, Explain to them, you know, your process, when you're going to punch, when we're going to turn over, what does turn over mean? Because we all know our opening teams are the most anal teams. They have, but that's their job. They have the better eyes, I guarantee you, than my project managers. They have an eye for detail, and they've done so many stores repetitively, they know where we make mistakes. Inspection sign-offs, they all tell you they're responsible for it. You have to stay on top of it because they will miss some items. And then you get yourself involved with them always. You've got to always keep the, uh, the, uh, the leaders of those companies involved and, uh, and to make sure they understand who you are, how serious you are about your business. And again, do not sit down think it's sitting. It's uh, happening there. You've got to travel and you've got to go meet those people. GCs, my typical schedule in the US for a big flagship, we all know the, our GCs in the US. They'll need time. It used to be nine months. I said, okay, great. We're going to go do the same process. Well, five months into it, I'm like, nothing is happening. <laughs> Everything over there happens the last three months. Then they wake up, oh shit, now we need to open. But they're used to that. They're, they're quick, they're all travelers. Like, you know, they bring people from Italy to do plaster. They're, even if the project is in Germany, they, they bring people to, to do it quick. And when these people come, they live at the store. Like, they work 18, 20 hours, and they want to go back. So I'm like, it drove me crazy, I couldn't get used to it. So I said, well, I'm gonna test it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut my schedule to six months. Then they panic. I'm like, well, make up your mind which way you want. <laughs> you know, I gave you nine. You didn't do anything the first five. Now I'm giving you six because guess what? They made it in six. Now I'm testing a store in Amsterdam in five months. They're panicking about it. I said, well, now you're going to show me what you can do. Okay? So the, it's, uh, it's something you have to stick first to your process. If you... Uh, if you're wasting time, and you can tell if you are, change it. Change the durations, because all that's that means is you're going to open earlier and start getting some re revenues into it. Okay? So our leadership were very happy when I started shrinking the, the construction, but I never shrunk the design phase, because, because that's really the meat of, of, of all that design. Uh, one thing I, I didn't put here is after you open the store, Make sure your maintenance people have the contacts of the people who built the store, okay? Because I can tell you in Singapore, for example, the GC, I didn't know that they have a division in Singapore. Their job is servicing stores and maintenance. So my maintenance department were very grateful that I hooked them up with them. In Europe, the same way. So, so do not just walk out and let them figure it out. May share with them the, the contacts. As built, I think you guys seen a couple presentations on laser to CAD uh, presentation. That is a great tool I use for as builds. I hire these people for every store we build internationally to go in before fixture day 
and at night before opening because you know that's the night we give everybody time off so a store is, is empty. That is my best as built for every store. To, if somebody comes to me and you said, you know, you, you gave it to me missing this and this, I'm like, well, sit down, let's watch which room you're talking about. And try to find that technology that helps you once you're done. And that's a great record, really. These guys give you a lot of information after you're done. Finally, <laughs> learn from your mistakes in each country and at each stage of the process. Like I learned about the schedules. That was a mistake to give them too much time. It didn't matter. Uh, I learned about like millwork, you know, the way you, they put it. They don't use glue in some countries. We're used to glue and then the pneumatic uh, gun, you know, the pneumatic pin. Dusseldorf, the guy decided in, instead of buying a pneumatic pin, he bought an Uzi. <laughs> Everywhere you're going, oh my God, what, did, what, what are all these nails go, doing here? And I'm like, he walked in like with an Uzi and just every trim, everything. So, so it costed me money to patch all this stuff. I'm like, you're paying for all that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, have you heard of glue? Oh yeah, we know glue. Well, have you tried using it? <laughs> uh, uh, there are shared lessons between countries. Uh, especially like, you know, when you go to the UK and uh, uh, UK, what was, it, what was I just, and Hong Kong. These two, like we're building a big store in Hong, in Hong Kong and we built a couple hosters. These two countries, it's easy there. Like I'm not running into problems. China, oh my God, you've got to like really get involved. About two weeks ago, I came a meeting from China just to meet with the planning committee and the mayor of the district to, get, to sell him on our store design that you've seen because they want you know, light and all this stuff. So you've got to pick who are the right people going to help you make the decision. I literally was in front of the mayor. He speaks Chinese. He's got an interpreter. You know, I'm like, here's our brand. He said, yeah, I'm happy. You're going to provide us a lot of revenue. I said, OK, well, talk to your people. So he brought in the, con the head of construction department, planning compartment, blah, blah. He made sure that they heard his message. Next day, I met with the planning authority. I said, just send it as an amendment and consider it done. So you've got you've to know who is who. And you yourself, as a leader, have to be there because they care a lot about titles, who's coming. Based on who's coming, they arrange the people levels who are going to meet with you, OK? Especially also in France. And make sure they speak some language, the same language. Uh, keep track of, of what you did in each country as far as timelines and cost. You'll, you'll be amazed how you hear about like Germany is more expensive than Italy, blah, 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 and then you'll find out it's the opposite. And you can offer these people. You can always negotiate with them, say, hey, I paid you this in Italy while you're charging me more in Spain. You know? so, so keep track of all that items because it helps you save some money. Do not stereotype, guys. Don't say you know, China you know, or, per, or you know, the French are this and that. It's the people you're going to end up with working are the people. Stereotyping a country doesn't get you anywhere. We all know their, the reputation of the French, the reputation of the Germans, the reputation of the Chinese. Don't, don't pay attention to any of that. That is really my advice, OK? The only problem with the French is they want to deal with the French-born person when you're in meetings. So make sure you take a French person to that meeting, and they're happy. So, and the people you hire are the people who's going to make it work. I developed a lot of friendships and uh, relations in, in every one of those countries. So tell your people, do not stereotype, do not, you know, what you know about that country or stuff, get it out of your head. Deal with the people. And again, do not sit at your desk <laughs> because you've got to travel. And uh, without doing that as a leader, okay, don't think that your designer traveled the item as dealt with, or the project manager, or the construction manager. None of these guys uh, really 
going to do the job you do it. Their, their thoughts are different than yours. That's in a nutshell. I'm sorry if I went over five minutes. It's okay. We have more time in this room, but some of the 915 meetings are starting. But so if anybody has any questions. Do you have any questions I can help you with? Or feel free, if you want, email me about any, any country you're going to. I'll be happy to share our experiences there. Any questions? Yes. Yes. And that's our, uh, that's our legal team's job is to tell me not to fall into traps. Okay? And we know about certain countries. I don't want to mention names. We try to follow really the laws and we don't care about, about paying off people or whatever the case is. Our legal team, before every entry, they give us a training actually. They do, and they ask me, who do you want to attend that training? And they go through all that training with them to make sure they don't fall into traps. Great question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. We enjoyed it. Great. Thank you. We'll see you outside.